2 Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor, and the rich man had very many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and grew it up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there was a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives in your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in, this, in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me, have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this, of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child which is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. And David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground, and the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do to himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. When he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. And then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for your child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent, him, sent a message by Nathan the prophet, and so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and took the royal city, and Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then gather the rest of the people together and camp against the city and take it lest I take the city and it be called by my name. And so David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he, he took the crown of their king from his head, and the weight of it was a talent of gold, and it, in it was a precious stone, and it was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. And he brought out the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them toil at the brick kilns. And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites. And then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, inspiring the writers of Scripture uh, to record your word for us and preserving it for so many years. We pray now that we would sit under the authority of your word. In Christ's name, amen. Well, most of you, like myself, like to, um, I think most of you, like to avoid conflict in life, right? I think that's true of most of you. Um, whether it's conflict at home, conflict at work, conflict at school perhaps, uh, conflict in a relationship with a spouse, whatever it can be, 
generally we don't run to conflict and, and, and enjoy it usually. Uh, most of the time we run away from conflict. We, we seek to avoid it. Most of us are people pleasers and we don't want conflict. And, and the reasons we run, for, run from conflict are, are various, they're numerous. Or a few of them that I think that we probably struggle with or that you probably struggle with might be one of these. One could just be fear, fear of that conflict, maybe a past experience when something just blew up in your face and so you're hesitant, you're afraid uh, to confront in a situation. Another reason might be just stress, just the, it's mentally taxing, it's difficult, and it's just easier to let it go, it, avoid the stress. Um, I've had conversations with people like that. Uh, they just don't want to deal with it. Maybe you like to avoid conflict because sometimes you don't know how to communicate what you want to say. And it's, it's an inability to communicate what you're thinking or feeling, and so because you can't articulate it and communicate it, you hesitate and don't say anything. Maybe that's a reason. Another one could be you just lack confidence and doubt yourself and say, well, maybe I, mean, I was going to confront this person on this situation, but maybe I don't know the whole story. Maybe that's just my opinion. Maybe I don't know everything. Maybe, maybe there's another side of the story. And so you're hesitant. You lose confidence in, in your position or your opinion on something. Or maybe you just, and this is another fear one, maybe you're just afraid that this person won't be your friend or this person won't be in your life anymore if you confront them on something. There are a lot of different reasons. Um, so maybe, maybe it's that. Maybe you're afraid someone won't like you or you'll lose that relationship. And it maybe it doesn't occur to you that if you don't confront them, you might lose the relationship anyway. Um, whatever the reasons, most of us tend to avoid conflict. Uh, I was thinking about it. I think I only have one friend <laughs> who I'm suspicious of who, who seems to, and I think he likes conflict. Um, don't worry, this person does not live here. Um, but I'm pretty sure he does. And there's some pretty funny stories uh, from when I think he's pretty much just en enjoys it at times. Um, but that's only one person I know, and he doesn't live here. Um, and we get along great, so it works out great. Um, but everyone else pretty much shies away from conf conflict for the most part. And so I share that with you because I want you, as we read God's Word each week, I always want you to engage the story, engage the narrative, engage the text. Don't just go straight to application, but understand the story. Get involved in the story and then ultimately apply it. And so I share that with you because I want you to imagine that you're the prophet Nathan. This is about 2,900 years ago. Imagine you're the prophet Nathan, and you're sitting at home in your little, um, your little house in Jerusalem, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a Sunday afternoon, and, and you're Nathan, and you're just leisurely reading through, you're pulling off your favorite scroll off the, the wall, and you're reading it, you're having a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, doing something like that. Maybe, maybe you're the prophet Nathan, and you're you're crunching numbers on your retirement account, uh, seeing when you can retire from your prophetic office. Uh, maybe you're cleaning your leather sandals, but you're just taking it easy on a Sunday afternoon. Because that's what's going on. Nathan gets the word from the Lord. Nathan, I need you to go talk to the king. And imagine you're Nathan, you get that, and you say, okay, I love King David. David is great. You know, God, he just took Bathsheba. He's taking care of her. King David's great. He's one of my favorite guys. He's a great king, so much better than that previous guy I saw we had. I'll go talk to King. What do you want me to talk about? And God says, I want you to go talk to King David because he's committed adultery. He's committed murder, and he's lied about it, and I need you to confront him. If you're Nathan and you're a normal person, do you engage that and, and get excited about confronting the king of Israel, your boss, for lack of a better term, about murder, adultery, lying? I, I don't know that, I don't know Nathan, obviously. I don't, if he's like us, he probably did not want to do that. He didn't just volunteer for this job. God called him to do it. Go confront the king. I imagine I was thinking about this this morning. I bet Nathan at this point wishes he had a, a prophetic intern. <laughs> Pass on the intern. Hey, intern Charlie, uh, go, go talk to the king. I don't want to do this. I'm going to read some scrolls. Uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't imagine he wanted to engage the king and confront him, but he had to, and he did it. He was obedient. And he confronts the king. He obeys the Lord. And so this morning, we're seeing a confrontation between the king of Israel and this prophet Nathan. And we're going to see this morning how David responds and deals with the conflict. But ultimately, we're going to see after that how God deals with this conflict, how God handles the situation and what it shows us about David's sin, God's response to that, and really about your sin and God's response to that in the context of conflict and confrontation. So our first thing is to look at how David reacts in this story. And it begins as Nathan gets the word from the Lord and says, okay, I'm going to go, go talk to the king. And Nathan shows up and tells this story of a rich man and a poor man. 
and the rich man had all this stuff, but the poor man only had this one little lamb. He fed, uh, he took care of it, treated it, the text says, like a daughter. He took care of it. And there's a subtle, I think, little clue in the text. He says, and this little lamb lay in his arms, which is kind of a subtle jab at David, because David had another man's wife in his arms. And you know the story that Nathan gives. It's the rich man who had everything, but yet he still stole the poor man's little lamb and barbecued it for dinner. He stole it. He had everything and he stole it. And it shows a ruthless, cold-hearted, merciless man. And as we hear this story, and if you've grown up in the church, some of you, a lot of you maybe have, you've heard this story and it's familiar. And as we read it, we hear it as a parable maybe or as a fable that he's telling him. But I want you to ask, okay, how, did, how would David have heard that story as king of Israel? He's listening to his prophet, Nathan, tell him this story about this rich man and the poor man. How do you think David heard it? David heard it probably, I'm I'm speculating here a little bit, probably heard it as a judicial case. Because remember, David is the House of Reps, he's the Senate, he's the Supreme Court, and he's the President. David's the guy. He's the king, right? And so he, he is the lawmaker, the judge. And so it's probable that he heard this as a legal case being presented to him. And as he hears it, David has this self-righteous anger that, you know, you can imagine Christ in the temple and he's upset and angry over unrighteousness. That's kind of David's anger here over something he knows is wrong. And David's not thinking about his own personal morality or personal ethics. He's thinking about the law. He's the king. And David renders a swift and angry judgment. He says, this man will die. This rich man will die because David is saying, I'm I'm the judge. And literally what that means is, in Hebrew, son of death. Actually, in my notes, I think it's a typo. I put son of a death. Maybe that was a typo. But it's really a son of death. He's the son of death, meaning this man will not live, is what David is saying. There is judgment coming on this man. And David says, according to the Mosaic law, he will lose fourfold. He's going to lose fourfold of what he took. And so David is demonstrating this, this righteous outrage over true social injustice. True social injustice. And, and, but what David doesn't realize is he's rendering a guilty verdict on himself, not on another man. He doesn't know that. And that's when Nathan the prophet steps in. And remember... For some context here, it's helpful to remember this Nathan the prophet is the same prophet who showed up many years earlier and made this promise of grace, 2 Samuel 7, that there would be a promise of grace on the house of David, a blessing on the house of David, and that the house of David would reign forever on the throne, which is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Now this prophet is coming back with another word for the house of David, and it's not a promise of of blessings and everything's going to be fantastic. It's a promise that there's going to be murder. There's going to be immorality. There's going to be death. There's going to be violence in your house for all of your days now, David. That's the consequence for your sin. And that's when Nathan steps in and the trap is set for David. And Nathan steps in as we read. He says, you are the guilty man. The rich man, you are that rich man who did that. You are, David, you are the wealthy man who wasn't satisfied with everything. You are the rich man who savagely stole from the poor man. You're the elitist who had no heart and stole from this man and and robbed him of his life, really. You are the guilty man. And and, and Nathan goes on in verse 8 and following, if you read that, to add, and he makes it explicit. He said, David, God has given you everything. You were out in the fields. Your brothers weren't even hanging out with you in the fields when Samuel showed up. He's given you everything. You're now king over Israel. The military has expanded, the the state of Israel has expanded its largest boundaries for the tribes of Israel under your rule. God's given you money, he's given you this family, he's given you wealth and power. All those were things that God gave you. And he says it was not enough. He says you were not satisfied, David, with any of that. You're the rich man, David, you're the man, you're guilty. And so David here is confronted with the horror, it really is horror, the horror of his own sin. It is the, that is the law, as I mentioned earlier. That is the law. That is Nathan holding up a mirror to say, here's who you are, David. Do you know that's who you are? You're a sinner. And how does, how does David react when confronted with the law? Let's just stop for a second. How do you react when someone confronts you when you've done something wrong? That's a little bit more personal. Do you get defensive? Do you make excuses? Do you blame others and say, well, it's, it's really this guy's fault, or it's really her fault. She did it. That's, I mean, if you remember in the context, that's what King Saul used to do. The old guy, the, the, the previous administration, 
He would not take responsibility. He would not acknowledge it when Samuel confronted him. He looked for excuses. And, and that, that's common today. I mean, you think about your own life, that's even common today. Uh, when confronted with heinous sins, people don't often repent. Uh, there are a couple of notorious stories. This is going back several, many years, actually. Uh, there was a southern pastor. I think this, I want to say it was in Louisiana. And he was convicted by the feds for trafficking cocaine from South America into the United States. And they investigated, found him, and got convicted. He went to prison, paid a huge fine. Um, this is a pastor. Um, do you think he repented when confronted by the feds and confronted with prison time? No, he didn't. There was another pastor. This was in Texas. This was, again, many years ago. I'm not a current, not a current megachurch pastor, so don't get suspicious. This was years ago. Large church, and he had beautiful family, large church, um, all this stuff. And after many years, he was eventually confronted um, by the deacons of the church. They didn't have elders for some reason. They had deacons that were the leadership there. And the deacons confronted him about multiple, not one, multiple affairs in the church. Even though he was a married man, had, had family, but it wasn't enough for him. And they confronted him on it. Do you think that man repented and acknowledged it? And No, he didn't. So my point here is that even today, human nature hasn't changed much. There is that desire to say, to maybe to lie about it, to blame others, to make excuses, to try to pass on the responsibility to somebody else. We're, we're tempted to do that when, if someone confronts you or someone confronts me, to say, well, you know. There's, there's always an explanation. There's always a lie. There's always something. That's a temptation. You don't have to do that. That's a temptation. What does David do? To get back to our text. David doesn't do that. Verse 13. What does David say? He says, I have sinned against the Lord. David repents. Straightforward repentance. He acknowledges his crimes against God. He acknowledges that God had given him everything that he had, and it wasn't enough. He acknowledges that God had a law, and David was living by his own law. And you can't do that without consequences. David demonstrates through his words his need for forgiveness, to repent, to find the grace of God. As a very quick aside on this, think about this for David. This is the king of Israel acknowledging in that culture, under Mosaic law, a capital offense. How many today, and this is rhetorical, please do not answer this, how many today, local, state, national, government officials, when confronted with crimes, just repent? Don't, don't respond to that, please. <laughs> um, and there's all kinds of people you can think of, um, all kinds of people, and I decided not to, to mention any. But most, my point here is most don't. So it is remarkable. David is a sinner. It is remarkable that David does repent because most, many do not. Many do not, but David does. And so last week we definitely were beating up on David because he's committing horrific crimes, but at the same time, let's acknowledge, wow, those were awful things. Uh, he does repent, and many people do not. Sometimes many of us do not. So David's reaction really should be your reaction when convicted of sin, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, which is his, one of his jobs. It's to not get defensive, not to lie, not to cover it up, not to blame, not to make excuses, but to do what David does, which is to repent, to ask for forgiveness, to seek the Lord, to seek his mercy. And so that's David's reaction, and, and we should, in a sense, acknowledge that. This is a remarkable thing that he does. The king acknowledges he's guilty, and the penalty would have been death. It's a remarkable thing that he does. And he writes about it in Psalm 51, which we read earlier uh, in the service. So that we've seen that, David's committed these horrible sins. He's committed adultery, murder. He's lied about it. He's coveted it. He's broken. You know, Moses broke the Ten Commandments by smashing them. David broke them by living, really. We talked about that last week. He broke them, pretty much all of them. And yet his reaction is repentance, and it reveals in part why God says he was a man after his own heart. Because David wasn't perfect. He sinned but he valued being restored to God more than anything, even when this would have been a capital offense. He wanted God. And so how does God react? That's the next point. How does God react to David's sin? And I want you to see three things here, three things. The first is that how does God deal with confrontation? He confronts. That's the first thing. He confronts David. God does not just look the other way on what David does. He doesn't just put up with it. He doesn't say, try harder next time. I think that's a temptation in our culture is to think, in our, in our culture, if there is a God, there may or may not be a God, but if there is, he'll put up with me at the end of the day because there's worse people. And that, that might be fine. That might get you to sleep at night, but it's not biblical. 
The Bible is pretty clear. Francis Schaeffer wrote so much about this. There is a God. He is there. He is not silent. He speaks, and he speaks through his word, and his word is clear on many things. God doesn't look the other way. He confronts people. God's not afraid of confrontation. The problem is God's not seeking it. We've sought it out through our sin. God's not looking to pick a fight, but he will confront on sin because he's a holy and just God. So God confronts David of his sin, just as God confronts you and I on our own sin. That is, as I said a minute ago, that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convict us. John's Gospel says that he will convict the world of sin because we are lawbreakers. And I say we, us. We are lawbreakers. We like to live for ourselves rather than live for God. It's called total depravity, original sin. We, we value success many times over God. We value our careers over God. We value health and fitness over God. We value money or reputation or we value education or family. We value all kinds of things over God or are tempted to value all kinds of things rather than God. And God does not allow that to happen in your life. He confronts you on your sin because God is holy. He is just. He is righteous. He can't just look the other way. He will not just look the other way. He doesn't just put up with you. And you don't really want that kind of God anyway if you really thought about it. You don't want a guy who just puts up with you and says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put up with her now. I'll deal with this person, right? He doesn't, that's not the God you want. You want a God who will confront you on your sin and bring you into relationship with you despite that sin. He confronts, he convicts you so that you will repent, so that you will turn to him, so that you'll become more and more like Christ, Romans 8, and less and less like the person you could become, to be honest with you, if you're not pursuing Christ. Because you're either becoming more like him or you're becoming more like somebody else, and it's not someone you want to be like. So he confronts. That's the first thing. Will you repent or will you fight God when he confronts with sin? The second thing is consequences. There are consequences for sin. God confronts when sin. That's his reaction. Second of all, there are consequences. David repents of his sin, and he asks for forgiveness, but there are still the results of sin in his life. It's not an eternal punishment. It's not a, it's not a purgatory. It's not a temporary punishment. But there are, there are temporal consequences for his sins. And we, we see the clear one in the text. He's going to lose his infant son. We're going to see very shortly in the weeks ahead. Uh, hopefully this won't be around Christmas. Um, but Absalom, his son, is, is going to do some pretty horrific stuff. And hopefully, I'll, honestly, hopefully I don't have to preach on that on Christmas because that could be awkward. Um, we'll work around it. Ultimately, seriously, ultimately, he is going to lose in the, in the rest of the text of 2 Samuel. He's going to lose four sons. And just like David said, there's a four, he wanted a fourfold punishment for this rich man in the story. David's going to lose four sons in the text. And we'll see that in the weeks ahead uh, as we study the, the rest of the life of David. So there are consequences. When you decide to reject God's will and reject God's law and do your own thing, which is sin, sins of commission and omission, there are consequences in this life for sin. So when you lie, when you steal, when you cheat, when you do whatever those things are, lose your temper, when someone will not get out of the left lane and get to the right lane and, and drive a normal speed and you lose your temper, which didn't happen this morning, it happened last Sunday actually, um, there are consequences perhaps for that. There are temporal consequences. Because God's forgiveness of your sin doesn't erase the damage. I want you to hear this clearly. God's forgiveness of your sin does not erase the damage that you do to yourself and do to others. Because your sin, and, and I'm in that same group, we're all in this together, it damages yourself, and it damages others. The Bible's clear. That's not my opinion. That's, the Bible's clear on that. And there are consequences. And, and, and God allows those. He allows those in David's life. He's going to allow those in your life. And as, as a quick footnote here, I want to briefly add, because this is something that I struggle with, and I know most people do. This is, this is human nature. Just because, we're talking about consequences, just because something goes wrong in your life, do not assume that it is God's punishment for your sin or consequences for sin. That's something that we all, I think, at some point wrestle with and think about. I think it's a temptation that, um, that Satan uses when something goes wrong in your life to say, well, this is God's punishment. God doesn't really like you. He's upset. And my point here, very briefly, is when something goes wrong, don't assume it's, it's discipline or consequences for sin. It could be, but it, not, it might not be. And ultimately, it's not your call. It's not your decision to make that judgment. Because there's a lot you don't know. There's a lot I don't know. And I thought about that, and I thought about that, you know, this, this weekend in our retreat, we were looking at the Apostle Paul's, some of his words to the, the Christians in Ephesus. And if you look at the Apostle Paul, 
in 2 Corinthians 11. Think about the negative things that Paul experienced. And here's just a handful of things. Five times he was beaten with 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Stoned nearly to death. He was shipwrecked and almost died at sea. He was at danger on roads and on on boats, on the seas. He fought angry mobs. He often spent the night without a roof, without food, without clothing. He experienced a lot more in his several decades of, of church planning and mission work than any of us will. And did Paul see that as punishment for sin? Did he see that as the consequences of his earlier terrorist activities pre Acts 9? He didn't. He saw those as opportunities to share the gospel. He saw those as opportunities for sanctification. He saw God using those things, Romans 8, 28, all things working together for his eternal good. He didn't see those things. Getting beaten by rods again, getting lashes again. I mean, they're stoning me, God. I mean, I, I repented. He didn't see those things as punishment. And so I just want to be clear on that because I know some of you, myself included, might think that when something goes wrong, this is punishment. Don't assume when something goes wrong in your life, it's because of sin. Don't assume that. Could be, but it could just be because we live in a sinful, fallen world, and God has not re- redeemed it yet. He's not renewed it. He's not made all things new yet, as we saw in Revelation. That's coming. It's not here yet. So don't assume it's punishment. So we've seen that God confronts sin. That's the first thing. There are consequences for sin. And then finally this morning, God calms the sinner. He calms the sinner. He gives peace to the weary, worn-out sinner. Verse 13, Nathan the prophet says to David, The Lord has put away your sin. God's just put it away. And so if if you're studying the Bible and you read something like that, you should ask, where did he put it? Where did that sin go? Where Where does God put that sin? Does he just forget about it? What does he do? David's sin, let's just get straight to the theology here of it. David's sin was ultimately put on Christ nine centuries later at the cross. Where did God put it? God put it on Jesus Christ at the cross. Application. Where does God put your pride? Where does he put your selfishness? Where does he put your dishonesty, your idolatry, whatever it might be? Where does he put that sin when you repent? It's placed on Christ. Christ bears it at the cross. He bears that on the cross for you because Jesus Christ can and did bear the wrath of God on sin, the just wrath. It's just. It's right. You and I cannot bear that. We can't handle that. It will break you. But Christ has done it at the cross. He did it 2,000 years ago. And so ultimately for David, he can find peace and rest. And our assurance of pardon came from uh, Psalm 32. David writing about, blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven. That's probably in response to Psalm 51. David has the calmness, the peace that his sin is forgiven. And you this morning can have the rest and the peace and that calmness that your sin is forgiven if you put your faith in the crucified and risen Redeemer. That that is the promise of the gospel. The gospel is not here to make you a better person, to help course correct. It's not just a part of your life. That is the radical promise of Scripture, that your sins are forgiven. If you are trusting in Him, your sin is paid for. If you understand that you are not good enough, you will never be good enough, but Christ is perfect. He is good enough, and He has paid the penalty for your sin. If you know that and if you believe that, then that same Holy Spirit who convicts you of sin is the one who is, again, going back to John's gospel, he is the comforter, the one who brings the promises of the gospel to your heart, to your mind, and assures you of God's promises. He is the one who applies the cross to you if you've repented. He brings peace. He brings the promises of the gospel to you. He brings it to you, honestly. He brings it to you through the word of God. As we read it, as you hear it preached, he reassures you. He does it. He, he ministers. The Holy Spirit ministers that, that promise through the sacrament. It's the visible gospel, as Augustine said, to remind you in a tangible way, Christ died for my sins. Why am I trying so hard to pay him back? Why am I trying so hard to earn something when he's already done it for me? That's what the sacrament tells us. And so this morning, know that God will confront you. He does confront you on your sin. Know that there are consequences for your sin in this life. But also know that God brings a calmness and a peace to you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when you trust in Him and when you are following Him and repent and follow Him. And so this morning, believe that. Trust in that as we we go to the sacrament this morning. Let's pray.